During the early 1800s, the United States expanded westward. Life on the new frontier deepened Americans' faith in the common person who built the new nation. Equality and rugged individualism were important concepts expressed in the Declaration of Independence and reaffirmed by Westerners who believed all people of all classes were important. The kind of faith in the working person and in American civilization underscored to the frontier people the necessity of school. In the urban east, the lower classes, particularly immigrants, also valued free schooling and linked it to social mobility and the American dream. The upper class establishment may not have had faith in the the masses, but they reluctantly accepted the argument of Jefferson Rush and, and now Horace Mann that mass education was necessary for intelligent participation in the political democracy and for economic growth of the country. The Monitorial School was a European invention based on Joseph Lancaster's model of education. It spread quickly in the U.S., two U.S. urban centers, where immigrant populations were increasing and to the frontier where there was need for a system, a system of schools. It was, an attra- it was attractive in the 1820s and the following decades due to its economy and efficiency. Bright student monitors served as instructors. The teacher taught the lesson to the monitors, which were high-achieving students, who presented the material to their classmates. The instruction was highly structured and based on rote learning and drilling the three R's. Proponents of the monitorial teaching system stressed that it was economical and kept all students busy while the teacher was occupied with a few students. The class was divided into smaller groups with a monitor in charge of each group. The students were kept actively involved in the practice and drill activities and moved at their own pace. Teachers were freed from some of their instructional chores. The monitorial system was considered efficient. The monitorial system de-emphasized classical education and religious theory and stressed the three R's in good citizenship, demonstrated the possibility of a systematic instruction, and acquainted many people with formal education and made educational opportunities more widely available. Most important, it promoted mass education and tax-supported elementary schools. At the peak of its popularity in the 1840s, it was introduced in some high schools and suggested by educators and state agencies for colleges. However, many people consider the monitorial system too mechanical. It was, it was critical, criticized for using poorly informed students as instructor. By 1850, its popularity had waned. The common school was established in 1826 in Massachusetts when the state passed a law requiring every town to choose a school board to be responsible for all local schools. Eleven years later, the state legislature created the first state board of education and Massachusetts organized public common schools under a single authority. Connecticut Connecticut quickly followed its neighbor's example. The common schools were devoted to elementary education with an emphasis on the three R's. Horace Mann spearheaded the movement, which was rooted in progressive thought. As a member of the Massachusetts legislature and later a Massachusetts first commissioner of education, Mann rallied the public's support for common school by appealing to various segments of the population. To enlist the business community, he argued that education has a market value, with the yields similar to common bullion. Industry's aim and the nation's wealth would be augmented in proportion to the diffusion of knowledge. Workers would be more diligent and productive. Mann also established a stewardship theory aimed at the upper classes, which stated that the public good would be enhanced by public education. Universal education would create a stable society in which people would obey the laws and increase the nation's political and economic well-being. Man told workers and farmers that the common school would be a great equalizer and a means of social mobility for their children. 
To the Protestant community, he argued that the common school would assimilate ethnic and religious groups and promote a common culture and help immigrant children to learn English. U.S. Customs and U.S. Laws. Mann was convinced that the common school was crucial to equal opportunity and a national identity. The pattern for establishing common schools and their ability varied among the states, but the foundation of the U.S. public school was being forged. Schools taught youngsters of all economic and religious backgrounds from age 6 to 14 or 15. Because individualized teachers taught a variety of subjects to children of all ages, they had to plan as many as 10 to 20 different lessons a day. Teachers also had to try to keep their schoolhouse cool for the summer and warm in the winter, a responsibility shared by the older boys who cut and fetched wood. Schoolhouses often needed major repairs and teachers were paid miserably low wages. New New England state legislatures uh, encouraged the establishment of school districts, elected school boards, and enacted laws to govern the schools. Although the common school had problems and critics, it especially flourished on the frontier where the local one-room schoolhouse embodied the pioneers' desire to provide free education for their children. The one-room schoolhouse eventually led to one of America's most lasting sentimentalized pictures the little red schoolhouse in almost every community it was a manifestation of the belief held by most of the frontier leaders that a school was necessary to raise the level of american civilization this small school meager outlook and thwart this small school meager in outlook and thwarted by inadequate funding and insufficient teachers nevertheless fit with the conditions of the American frontier. It was a blah school according to Abe Lincoln, but it was the kind of school in which the common person's children, even those born in log cabins, could begin their reading, writing, and ciphering. It was a school local citizens could use as a polling place, meeting hall, a site for dances, and other community activities. It was here on the frontier that the neighborhood schools, local control, and government support of schools took a firm hold. There was no consensus regarding an appropriate elementary school curriculum throughout the 1800s. The trend was to add courses to the essential subjects of reading, spelling, grammar, and arithmetic. Religious doctrine changed to manners and moral instruction by 1825. Textbook content was heavily moralistic and teachers provided extensive training in character building. By 1875, lessons in morality were replaced by lessons and conduct, which remained part of the 20th century curriculum. More and more subjects were added to the curriculum, geography and history by 1850, science, visual art, and physical education by 1875, and the nature study, biology and zoology, music, homemaking, later called home economics, and manual training by 1900. The common school created the basis for tax-supported and locally controlled elementary school education. The U.S. high school was established on this base. By 1900, most children ages 6 to 13 were enrolled in public elementary schools, but only about 11.5% of the children ages 14 to 17 were enrolled in public secondary schools, and only about 6.5% graduated. By 1970, 98% of the elementary age children attended school and 94% of the elementary age children um, did, with 77% graduating, secondary age children did, with 77% graduating. The great enrollment boom occurred between 1850 and 1900 for elementary schools and between 1900 and 1970 for high schools. From the 1980s to 2010, enrollment percentages leveled off to the mid-high 90s. 
In the early 1800s, the academy began to replace the Latin grammar school. By 1850, it dominated the school landscape. The academy offered a wide range of curricula. It was designed to provide a practical program for terminal students as well as college preparatory course of study. By 1855, more than 6,000 academies were teaching 263,000 students, more than two-thirds of the period's total secondary enrollment. According to Elwood Carberly, the academy taught useful things and subjects of modern nature nature that prepared students for life, not just for college. In 1828, the academies of the state of New York offered as many as 50 different subjects. In rank order, the top 15 were Latin, Greek, English grammar, geography, arithmetic, algebra, composition, and declamation, natural philosophy, rhetoric, and philosophy, U.S. history, French, chemistry, logic, and astronomy. By 1837, the State Board of Regents in New York reported 72 different subjects. Academies tended to offer a traditional curriculum that prepared students for college. Elmer Brown writes that in the best academies, the college preparatory course was the backbone of the whole system of instruction. Although practical courses were offered, it was the admission requirements of the colleges more than anything else that determined their standards of scholarship. Paul Moore concurs, the core of academy education yet remained the old classical curriculum, just as the core of the student body in more flourishing academies remained the group preparing for college. The era of the academies extended into the 1870s when public high schools replaced academies. The academies then served as finishing schools for young ladies, providing courses in classical and modern languages, science, mathematics, art, music, and homemaking. They also offered the normal, quote-unquote, program for prospective school teachers, which combined courses in arts and sciences with principles of pedagogy. A few private military and elite academies remain today. Although a few high schools existed in the early half of the 1800s, the first was founded in Boston in 1821, they did not become a major U.S. institution until after 1874 when the Michigan Supreme Court ruled in the Kalamazoo case that the public could establish and support high schools with tax funds. Thereafter, high schools rapidly spread and state after state made attendance compulsory. Students were permitted to attend private schools, but the states had the right to establish minimum standards for all. In 1890, the 2,525 public high schools in the United States had more than 200,000 students compared to 1,600 private secondary schools, which had fewer than 95,000 students. By 1900, the number of high schools had soared to 6,000, whereas the number of academies had declined to just 1,200. The public school system uh, continued contiguous with common schools had evolved. As late as 1900, high schools were attended by only a small percentage of the total youth population. However, the presence of terminal and college preparatory rich and poor students under one roof showed that the United States public had rejected the European dual system of secondary education. Fifty years later, when the U.S. high school had fully evolved, James Conant argued that for comprehensive high schools that served all types of learners and helped eliminate class distinction. The comprehensive high school provided curriculum options for all students. With these unsettled questions as background, the National Education Association organized three major committees between 1893 and 1895. The Committee of 15 on Elementary Education, the Committee of 10 on Secondary School Studies, and the Committee on College Entrance Requirements. These committees were to determine schools' curricula. Their reports standardized the curriculum for much of the 20th century. In Coverley words, the committees were dominated by subject matter specialists possessed of a profound faith in mental discipline. No concern for student abilities, social needs, interests, or capabilities found a place in their deliberations. 
The Committee of Fifteen was heavily influenced by Harvard University President Charles Eliot, who had initiated vigorous discussions on the need for school reform and by William Harris, then the U.S. Commissioner of Education, who believed strict teacher authority and discipline. Both Eliot and Harris wanted the traditional curriculum to remain intact. The committee adopted Eliot's plan to reduce the elementary grades from 10 to 8 and stressed, it, stressed the three R's, English, Grammar, Literature, Geography, and History. Hygiene and culture vocal music and drawing were each allotted one hour per week. Manual training, sewing, cooking, algebra, and Latin were introduced in the 7th and 8th grades. In general, the committee rejected the idea of newer subjects uh, to the uh, proposed principles that had characterized the reform movement of European pioneers since the early 1800s. Kindergarten, the idea that children's needs and interests should be considered when planning the curriculum, and the notion that interdisciplinary subjects. They compartmentalized subject matter, and this compartmentalization has remained the norm. Charles, chaired by Eliot, the Committee of Ten was the most influential of the three committees. It identified nine academic subjects as central to the high school curriculum, Latin, Greek, English, other modern languages, mathematics, which included algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and higher or advanced algebra, and then physical sciences, which included physics, astronomy, and chemistry natural history or biological sciences, again that included biology, botany, zoology, and physiology, and then the eighth subject, social sciences, which included history, civil government, which we now call civics, and political economy, or what we just call economy, and then the ninth subject area being geography, geology, and meteorology. The committee recommended four different tracks, a classical track, Second, a Latin scientific tract. Third, modern languages. And finally, fourth, English. The first two required four years of Latin. The first program emphasized classic English literature and math. The second, math and science. The modern language program required four years of French or German. Spanish was considered too easy and culturally and linguistically less important. I find that interesting today. The English program permitted four years of Latin, German, or French, noting that it didn't look like they taught very much English. The modern language and English programs also included literature, composition, and history. The Committee of Ten considered these two programs, which did not require Latin or emphasize literature, science, and mathematics, in practice distinctly inferior to the other two tracks. In taking this position, the committee indirectly tracked college-bound students into the first two programs, and non-college bound students into the latter two programs. To some extent, this bias reflected the committee's composition. Eight of the ten members represented college and private preparatory uh, school interests. The committee ignored art, music, physical education, and vocational education, maintaining that these subjects contributed little to mental discipline. Two curricularists write, the choice of these subjects and the omission of others from consideration was enough to set the course for secondary education for many years and didn't indirectly set the tone at the elementary level as well. The committee suggested that each of the nine subjects, except Latin and Greek, be taught at the elementary school level. And this, at that time, few students went to college. Nonetheless, this college preparatory program established curriculum higher, established a curriculum hierarchy from elementary school to college that promoted academics and ignored most students who were not college bound. Today, schools offer vocational, industrial, and technical programs, but the academic programs is still considered superior to others. 
When the Committee on College Entrance Requirements met in 1895, it reaffirmed the dominance of college preparatory curriculum in high schools, emphasizing college admission requirements and classical subjects, consisting mainly of college and university presidents, including Eliot again, Charles Eliot, uh, the president of Harvard, the committee recommended strengthening the college preparatory aspect of high school curriculum and made recommendations regarding the number of credits required in different subjects for college admission. The recommendations were reflected in the Carnegie Unit, a method of evaluating credits for college admission imposed on high schools in the year 1909 and is still used in most high schools today. Among other factors, immigration and industrial development led a growing number of educators to question the classical curriculum and its emphasis on mental discipline. The scientific movement in psychology and education in the late 19th and early 20th centuries also played a role, particularly the pragmatic theories of Charles Pierce and William James, the, the social theories of Darwin, Herbart and Spencer, and pedagogical views of Pestalozzi, Froebel, and Maria Montessori and others. This movement rejected the mental discipline approach and classic uh, curriculum and emphasized the vocational, technical, and scientific subjects. At the turn of the 20th century, education was strongly influenced by the ideas of Dewey and Francis Parker. The Gestalt psychology and child psychology movement, the learning theories of behaviorism and transfer learning, and the progressive movement in schools and society. Educators increasingly argued that the classics had no greater mental value than other subjects and that mental discipline, which emphasized rote learning, drill, and memorization, was not conducive to an inductive method of science or compatible with contemporary educational theory. Edward Thorndike, the era's most influential learning psychologist, wrote, the expectation of any large difference in general improvement of the mind from one study rather than another seems doomed to disappointment. The chief reason why good thinkers seem superficially to have been made such by having taken certain school studies is that good thinkers have taken such studies. Now that good thinkers study physics and trigonometry, though these seem to make good thinkers. If abler pupils should all study physical education and dramatic art, these subjects would seem to make good thinkers. By 1917, Charles Eliot, a former advocate of Latin, was saying that Latin should no longer be compulsory for high school and college students. Abraham Flexner, a former teacher of the classics, contended that Latin had no purpose in the curriculum and that the classics were out of step with scientific development. Flexner now argued that tradition was an inadequate criterion for justifying subject matter. Society was changing and educators also had to make changes in the curriculum. In his 1916 paper, A Modern School, Flexner rejected the traditional secondary curriculum as proposed and proposed a modern curriculum consisting of four basic areas, science, Secondly, industry. Third, civics. And fourth, aesthetics, which he considered literature, languages, arts, and music. Music. Modern languages would replace Latin and Greek. Flexner concluded that a subject had little value in the curriculum unless a utilitarian argument could be made for its inclusion. In other words, it had to be useful. Flexner's concepts of utility or usefulness and modern subjects tended to resemble Spencer's views on science and subject matter. The difference is that Flexner was attuned to the social and political climate of his time. Educators were willing to listen to his proposals. In 1917, the Lincoln School uh, of Teachers College, Columbia University, while Dewey was teaching, adopted Flexner's proposed curriculum. The school combined the four core areas of studies with emphasis on science, scientific inquiry. The same year that Flexner published A Modern School, 1916, Dewey published Democracy and Education, one of his most influential and probably cumbersome books, which discussed 
all of the elements of his philosophy. In the book, Dewey set forth the relationship between education and democracy, as well as the notion that democracy itself was a social process that could be enhanced through the school. Dewey considered schools as neutral institutions that could serve the ends of either freedom or repression and authority. Thus, the aims of the education went hand in hand with the particular type of society involved. According to Dewey, subjects cannot be placed in a value hierarchy. Study any subject can promote a child's development. Any study or body of knowledge was capable of expanding the child's experiences and contributing to his or her social and cognitive growth. Traditional subjects such as Greek or Latin were no more valuable than music or art. At the same time, Dewey prioritized science, which he saw as epitomizing rational inquiry. Science for Dewey was another name for knowledge, and it represented the perfect outcome of learning its consummation. What is known and settled? Dewey considered scientific inquiry to be the best form of knowledge for a society because it consisted of special methods which the race worked out in order to conduct reflection under conditions whereby its procedures and results were tested. Dewey's emphasis on science was basically based particularly in the work of Spencer, who believed science was the key to complete living, and to G. Stanley Hall, who started the child study movement in the 1880s and 1890s, and under whom Dewey studied when he was a doctoral student at Johns Hopkins University. With Hall, the child study movement was both research-based and systematic, whereby findings were supposed to be applied to the classroom. Although knowledge obtained from child study research was rarely used by teachers, it formed as a basis of the child development movement in the 1930s and 40s that was spearheaded by Robert Thorndike and Arthur Gersild in the United States and Jean Piaget in Europe. In 1918, the NEA's Commission on the Reorganization of Secondary Education published the highly progressive Cardinal Principles of Secondary Education. Influenced by Herbart's proposals, Flexner's A Modern School, and Dewey's Democracy in Education, the Commission stressed the whole child, not only cognitive development, education for all youth, not only college-bound youth, diversified areas of study, not just classical or traditional studies, and common culture, ideas and principles for a democratic society. The Commission noted the following five points. Education should promote seven aims, health, command of fundamentals, worthy home membership, which would be preparation for marriage and raising kids, vocation, citizenship, leisure, and ethical character. Number two, high schools should be comprehensive uh, in having the nation's social and economic groups. Number three, high school curricula should meet varied student needs. Number four, current educational psychology, psychological principles, and the methods of measurement and evaluation should be applied to secondary curriculum and instruction, which we'll talk about in later sessions where we talk about evaluation. In other words, they're suggesting that the curriculum needed to be evaluated periodically. And number five, U.S. educational institutions should function in conjunction with one another. High schools were assuming their modern curricular patterns, combining academic programs with several non-academic programs. English, math, science, social science, and modern languages were being emphasized. Classical languages and literature were losing ground. Aims and subjects were becoming interrelated. Utilitarianism was replacing the idea of mental discipline. Students' needs and interests were being considered. Schools were expected to serve all students, not only college-bound youth. The whole child was being emphasized and not just cognitive learning. Traditional education, which had long dominated U.S. education, was in decline. 
From the colonial period to around World War I, curriculum was a matter of evolving subject matter. Some reform ideas concerned pedagogical principles of the mid and late 1800s, mainly as a result of the European influence and emerging progressive reform movement of the earliest 20th century. But these ideas were limited to theoretical discussions and a few isolated innovative schools. The perennialist curriculum, which emphasized the classics and timeless and absolute values based on religious and then moral doctrines dominated for the first 150 years of our nation's history. The idea of curriculum principles and processes began to take shape after 1900. The scientific principles and progressive philosophy were increasingly influential. Curriculum as a field of study with its own methods, theories, and ways of solving problems has made real advances since the 1920s. Most of the advances have taken place since Tyler wrote his basic text on curriculum.